What's up, Ninja Nerds? Back again. Case study five, guys. Hope you guys liked the last week's one. Um, that one was a little bit easier. This one's even a you know, teensy bit easier. You guys already have an idea of what this is going to be on, which is nice. Um, so it's going to be on seizures, but we're going to have to figure out why this person is seizing and how to treat these people effectively, right? So let's go ahead and get started, guys. All right. First thing, medical disclaimer, all of these cases that we are presenting here are fictitious, they're not real. We're making them up, we're referencing these all from what we've created here at Ninja Nerd, um, and they're for educational purposes only, okay? All right, so let's go ahead and get started. 32-year-old female had a um, family who witnessed them have a generalized tonic-clonic seizure at home around 9 p.m. and called 911 patient never returned to their baseline, in other words, stopped seizing, um, and continued to seize until EMS arrived. When EMS did arrive, they were still seizing and they gave five milligrams of midazolam and the patient still continued to seize. Uh, patient was unresponsive and became acutely hypoxic and was being ventilated via a bag valve mask. On arrival to the emergency department around 9.15, they were super quick, <laughs> patient was still actively seizing, okay? So what is the past medical history on this patient? Nothing really specific. She's relatively healthy. She has a history of endometriosis. She had an ectopic pregnancy a couple years ago where she actually got a salpingotomy for it. Um, her social history is pertinent for no tobacco, recreational drug use. She does drink like one to two alcoholic beverages a week though. Her allergies, she is allergic to penicillin, but she just does, she gets a rash, not like an anaphylactic reaction. And then she takes naproxen 250 to 500 milligrams a day for her endometriosis pain, okay? So her vitals, uh, sure, her blood pressure is she is hypertensive. Blood pressure is 148 over 90. She's tachycardic at 135. Her respiratory rate is she is apneic. She's not actually breathing. She's being bagged right now. Um, and she's only holding 88% um, uh, while being bagged. Her temperature was 99 degrees Fahrenheit or 37.2 degrees Celsius. So she's afebrile. On your physical exam, what you're able to obtain here is that she looks very sick. You notice a tongue bite on the right side of the tongue when you open up her mouth. You notice a lot of pooling of oral secretions. She's unresponsive. She's not attempting to communicate with you. When you open up her eyes, her eyes have this up gaze with kind of like a little like roving movement. Her corneals, when you kind of take a little cotton swab and test, they are present bilaterally. And she's having this active tonic-clonic movement of her extremities as well. On the monitor, she's tachycardic, but it's a regular rhythm. It appears sinus tach. Uh, when you listen to her, she doesn't have any murmurs, any rubs, any gallops. You're listening to her lungs and they sound clear to auscultation. You don't hear any wheezing, any rails, or any ronchi. And her abdomen is nice and soft. It's not tender to palpation. She's got normal active bowel sounds, no rigidity, no guarding. Okay? So this is kind of what we have so far based upon uh, the chief complaint. Seizing, this constant seizing, not responding. She was hypoxic. She's being bagged. She got five milligrams of midazolam came in she's hypertensive tachycardic apneic she's has tongue bites pooling of oral secretion she's pretty much unresponsive upward gaze of the eyes active tonic clonic seizures okay so what is technically the diagnosis well, we know the person is seizing but what is the actual true definition of what this type of seizure is can you guys tell me what you guys think it is Someone already put, a lot of you guys have already put the answers in already. Good. Yep. So Rameza, Hader, um, Wally, you guys all pretty much put down the answers. Status epilepticus. So the question is then, how do you define status epilepticus? So, and if I were to say, give me a definition of status epilepticus, how would you define it? You guys know? <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll move on then. It's going to be definition here for it is what? 
It's whenever you have a seizure that is greater than or equal to five minutes, or you have a seizure after another seizure without any return to baseline. Okay. Yep. And now people are starting to say, it. yep, exactly. Great. Awesome. So we know that this person is in status epilepticus because they've been seizing for at least 15 minutes. Okay. It's either it's seizing greater than five minutes or they never return to baseline and she has never returned to baseline as well. So she fits kind of both categories of that definition. Awesome. You guys are so darn smart. All right, Ninja Nerds. So now that you guys have established that this person has status epilepticus, what's the first step? Okay. So I'm going to give you guys an option for you guys to pick. What would you do in this scenario? Would you give the person thymine and D50 empirically? Would you support the airway breathing and then her circulation if she needs it? Would you give her 0.1 milligram per kilogram of IV lorazepam or would you give her 0.1 milligram per kilogram of IV midazolam? So what do I mean by return to baseline? So in other words, she would stop seizing. So if she had, she had this generalized tonic clonic seizure and then she stopped seizing, that would be kind of her return to baseline, whatever she was doing beforehand. Great. Yeah, you guys are all, yeah, ABCs always is the first thing to do. So what would I do then for this patient? If it's always, holy crap, it's just, -da 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 -da. awesome guys, ABCs always first. So I guess the good question is, is what do we need to do within the ABCs? This person's hypoxic. They're not protecting their own airway. Their GCS is very low. What would I do? So what I would do is I would intubate the patient. Okay, so she definitely needs intubated. She's not protecting her airway. So I'm going to intubate the patient and the induction agent that I'm going to use, which has kind of a double benefit to sedate her a little bit, but also help to suppress some of those seizures, is I'll use propofol. Okay, her blood pressure can tolerate it as well. So that's a nice thing about giving it. So I can give her propofol. And then I can also paralyze her with a lower dose of rocaronium, generally like 0.6 milligrams per kilogram for a neurolytic intubation. Okay. Great, and all of you guys are saying this. And yep, that's the other thing too. Uh, suctioning the patient, that's always opening up the airway. So you should open up the airway, look for any visualized, visual, any obstructions. If she does have all these secretions, suction that, see if that improves it. Um, and then help to basically open up that airway the best that you can, maybe a nasal, oral pharyngeal airway. But most likely this patient's gonna need to be intubated, okay? Good, and then someone says phenylephrine. Yeah, you could have a push dose phenylephrine nest like you know, by bedside. Whenever you give propofol, it can vasodilate those blood vessels so it can make the pressure a little bit softer and drop the blood pressure. So having a little push dose phenylephrine can also be helpful for this patient. Okay, so I think you guys answered it very great. So first thing we do is airway breathing circulation. We're gonna intubate with propofol, rock, and then we're going to start controlling this via mechanical ventilation, okay? All right, you did that. Still seizing. What, what's the next step? All right, I'll give you guys option. Uh, do we check a point of care glucose? Do we load with levetiracetam, 60 milligrams per kilogram? Do we give 0.1 milligrams per kilogram IV lorazepam? Or do we give Narcan? So difference between airway and breathing. So and again, in this situation, airway is you're trying to make sure that the airway is patent. Um, so in this case, whoever said suctioning would have been, uh, that was perfectly correct in saying that you should suction them first. Um, if having all those oral secretions there are plugging up the airway, then if we kind of just move any of those secretions, that would be helpful. Also notice if they have any fractures, if there's any nasal fractures or fractures near the maxillofacial area, that's something that could be affecting their airway. Uh, notice any soot within the airways as well. And then for breathing, it's again, you need to breathe for them because they don't have the ability to breathe on their own. And so that's where intubation will come in. So rock over succinylcholine, that's a great question. I'm glad somebody asked that. Um, so you gotta be careful. Succinylcholine obviously has the ability to induce rhabdomyolysis. And so if this patient is seizing, they already might have a risk of rhabdomyolysis. So you may worsen that and then worsen you know, a kidney injury. So let's not try to induce any more rhabdo than the person may already be having. Okay. 
seen a lot of A and C. So A and C. So, you know, I think that uh, this could be kind of maybe a double, but for the first thing that you'd want to do is, so we already, A, B, C's is the first thing. The second thing is if we can reverse any easily reversible causes that may not require any benzodiazepines, we should try that. But it doesn't also hurt. This person's been seizing for almost 15 minutes. It doesn't hurt to give any IV lorazepam. But in the sequence of events of status epilepticus, you should probably check that glucose. Because what if they are just hypoglycemic? And all I need to do is give them some sugar, and that may actually help and reverse some of those seizures. Giving IV lorazepam, you wouldn't be wrong in doing that. Um, so just so you guys know, you can definitely give um, some IV lorazepam just if you're trying to go through your sequence of kind of event, like sequence of treatment, ABCs, any reversible causes that I can quickly reverse before I give a benzo would be kind of ideal. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. If you give rocaronium, you won't know if they're seizing neurologically. Yeah, that's important just because you actually are stopping the seizure. Uh, doesn't mean that the person isn't still seizing. Um, so what you'd probably want to do is put them on a routine or spot EEG just to make sure that they're still not seizing and you're not visibly seeing that. Plus, giving a lower dose of rocaronium is going to help with that in, in, in that instance. Okay? All righty. Yep, and then EMS should be checking blood sugar. They can definitely do that, okay? But again, it's just everything that you should be doing in sequence of events here is that, again airway, breathing, circulation, any reversible causes that I can quickly reverse. In this case, it's the glucose. What are some other reversible causes though that I could quickly do just to before I even go ahead and give any more um, benzodiazepines? There's a couple things that I could quickly and easily reverse if I have the correct clinical context. Uh, D50, it's just like, you know, it's basically a, a particular concentration of sugar. So D50 is almost like, it's particularly, again, it's a particular concentration of sugar. I would like to do electrolytes too. Yeah, that's fine. So yeah, what I would say is if we were to look for any quickly reversible causes here, hypoglycemia, right? That's the first one. So D50 would be helpful in that sense. If they're thymine deficient, you can give thymine. If they are coming in and they're pregnant, they have hypertension, they also are seizing, you can think about eclampsia, do they need magnesium? Are they taking opioids? Do we know if they have a history of opioid toxicity? Utilize your physical exam as well to, for looking for signs of opioid toxicity. You can give naloxone. Are they actually being treated for tuberculosis for some reason because they had an exposure? give them vitamin B6, okay? So these are some of the quick ones that you can just check. Another one that so, someone else said there is sodium. You can check sodium if you do a BMP and you check to see that they have hyponatremia and they're symptomatic, you can bolus them with uh, 100 milliliters of about 3% hypertonic saline, okay? All right, so I think that's the good thing to think about. Again, ABCs, check a point of care glucose, and if it's actually you know low, give them the sugars. But think about the other reversible causes that we can quickly fix, okay? All right, you gave them glucose. They're still seizing. <laughs> What's next? Do I give 0.1 milligrams per kilogram of IV lorazepam? Do I load them up with 60 milligrams per kilogram of uh, levetiracetam? Do I start a propofol infusion? Do I give 0.1 milligrams per kilogram of IV midazolam in this situation? Anybody have any thoughts? <laughs> Someone said it's lupus. <laughs> <laughs> Tramadol can cause seizures, absolutely. Opioids. Um, yeah, I think whoever said that A, although uh, A or D for Margaret, good. So a lot of options here. Okay, so let's see what we got here. So the next option here that we're going to try 
if we go here to pick the answer. So the answer here would be A and D. You can do either one of them. I think Margaret actually said that perfectly. So again, going through your steps, initial treatment is A, B, C's. Reverse any quickly, easily reversible causes. Then start a benzodiazepine. So we can give either 0.1 milligram per kilogram IV lorazepam. I like to give four milligrams right off the get-go. Or you can give 0.1 milligrams per kilogram of IV midazolam. Okay? Either way, it doesn't really matter. They're both benzodiazepines. Okay? Laugh <laughs> how the nursing student got it. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, either way, they're both benzodiazepines. They both have a somewhat similar efficacy, just different duration of time. Okay. All right. And then also the other kind of benefit to this to also think about is if you don't have IV access, so you can't give lorazepam, you can also give IM midazolam, like 10 milligrams as well. Okay. How do benzos work though? I guess is a good question. How do they actually work to stop a seizure? Do you guys know? So I'm gonna hit you guys with it. So they work by stimulating those GABA A receptors, right? So they work as agonists of the GABA A receptors and help to induce a lot of chloride ion influx. And as the chloride ions enter into these cells, they're gonna start causing the cells to become extra negative, hyperpolarizing them. If they hyperpolarize them, they'll actually help to induce decreasing those action potentials and then hopefully decrease a lot of the seizure activity. Yep, and you guys are nailing it. You're just a little bit uh, behind one from my uh, me starting it, sorry. <laughs> so, great. Why wouldn't you start propofol? You could. Again, here's the thing. It, there's nothing wrong. It's about how aggressive you want to be right off the get-go. What this is meant to tell you is to help you. What I'm trying to do, I guess, in this, this like, kind of like case study is take you through how you should step-by-step -step approach it. Whether you jump to a step right away if you want to go big guns all out, you can definitely start with a propofol infusion. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just about how aggressive you want to be um, is the question. Okay, there's nothing wrong with going straight up to propofol if you really want to. But maybe you wouldn't have to do that. And again, if you give propofol, um, you're going to have to intubate this patient most likely. It's unlikely that you'll be able to you know, keep their airway. Uh, while giving them propofol. But again, we are going to intubate them, so you wouldn't be wrong in saying, oh, shoot, start propofol. Okay. All right. You gave them a benzo. You gave them either the 0.1 milligram per kilogram of uh, lorazepam or you did the midazolam. They're still seizing. What do you do next? All right. So you repeated, you gave it, let's say that you gave another hit of benzos. So let's say that you gave them the benzos. Didn't work. Let's say you gave four milligrams of IV lorazepam. Didn't work. Gave another four milligrams of IV lorazepam. Didn't work. Now you're on the next step. What do you do? Do you load them up with levetiracetam, 60 milligrams per kilogram? Do you start a propofol infusion? Do you load the levetiracetam and start a propofol infusion? Or do you start midazolam infusion? Oh my gosh. Rishav, Rishav said, pray to God. Oh. <laughs> I mean, this is kind of pretty much very common, to be honest with you. It sounds very bad, but this is pretty common, to be honest with you. Let's go to CT if we can stop the seizure for a minute. Yeah, I mean, I think that right now the most important thing is, and Zach said phosphonatone. Yeah, here's again. Let me actually uh, reiterate here. When I say levetiracetam, I'm just picking one. You could pick phosphonatoin, you could pick phenatoin, you could pick valproate, you could pick lacosamide. It really, it's up to you and it depends upon the patient's comorbidities. If the patient's pregnant in this case, there's not a chance in this world I'm gonna give them valproate or give them phenatoin, phosphonatoin because that's teratogenic. If they have liver failure, I'm not gonna give them, again, valproate or phosphonatoin, phenatoin because that already has hepatotoxic effects. So again, you just have to think about the patient's underlying comorbidities as well when you give this. Levetiracetam is just good because there's not a lot of adverse effects. C, C seems to be the, pretty much the big answer. Let's see if you guys are right. Could be A or C. Right. So here's the next thing. 
the the uh, the algorithm says you start off with ABCs, reverse any quickly reversible causes, give them a benzodiazepine, load them up with an anti-epileptic. However, when you load some up with an anti-epileptic, it's going to take a bit before it actually starts to kick in. It's also going to take a while when you order the levetiracetam, it might take a while for it to actually come from the pharmacy. So at the same time, it is not a bad idea that you already have this patient intubated, start them on a propofol infusion. So you can do both. Start them on a propofol infusion and load them up with a anti-epileptic of particular choice. I just like to pick levetiracetam, okay? Because it's usually lower side effects with that one. Just you have to watch out for the kidneys. If someone has severe renal failure, then I might be a little bit lower in my dosages of uh, levetiracetam. But I think it's a good option to say A or C. Technically, the algorithm says you load them up with an antiepileptic, and if they're still seizing, then you start on with something else. That's perfectly fine, but I would say load them up with an antiepileptic and then start the propofol infusion, okay? So this is my explanation of that pretty much. C is preferred just because it's gonna take a bit for it to work. It's also gonna take time to get from the pharmacy. So start the propofol infusion along with that. Another thing to think about though, here is another option, is that maybe the person's blood pressure is really, really low and you don't wanna give the propofol infusion for some reason. Midazolam is another option that you can run through an infusion um, so that's another drug that you could give to this patient. Um, it just prefer to do propofol. Midazolam will work on the GABA-A receptors. Propofol will work on the GABA-A receptors. So somewhat a similar reaction. Midazolam is just a little bit more hemodynamically stable um, in comparison to something like propofol. Okay. So this is, again, this is just something that I think to, that you should think about. A, technically, if you were taking an exam, would be the correct answer. But in a real life scenario, it's not bad to just do both AED and start the propofol or midazolam, whichever one that you want to run in as an infusion to really shut down those seizures. Again, why not phosphenatoin? You could. There's no reason you couldn't start phosphenatoin or phenytoin or valproate. I'm just saying think about other, like their comorbidities. If they have thrombocytopenia, hepatotoxicity, things of that nature, valproate may not be a great thing. Do they have pancreatitis? It might not be a great thing. Again, it's nothing wrong with picking phosphenatoin, phenytoin, uh, levetiracetam, valproate, which leucosamide. You just have to think about their underlying condition. If a patient has a prolonged PR interval or a heart block, I'm not going to give leucosamide. So just think about that situation. Ketamine, drunk DM said ketamine. I love ketamine, ketamine is a great option. Um, I usually try not to go straight to ketamine right away. Um, ketamine does, actually ketamine does have anti-epileptic properties. It works on the NMDA receptors where glutamate binds onto. But I just, I don't jump straight to ketamine. I think propofol is a little bit better. And if I need to, um, I can also just give a presser to uh, kind of, again, balance out the effects of propofol dropping somebody's blood pressure, I can give them a phenylephrine drip, or I can give them a, levo, a, a norepinephrine drip to kind of counteract that. Okay. All right. So I think you guys did a great job on that one. <laughs> ah, she's still seizing. What the heck? <laughs> so we've done, we intubated her, controlled her airway. All right. We've revert. We've tried to reverse any quickly, easily reversible causes. We gave her a benzodiazepine. We loaded her up with Keppra. We started her on a propofol infusion. Let's say that we got that sucker up towards like 60, 80 mics. Okay. And they're still seizing. What the heck? What do I do now? Options. Do we continue the propofol infusion and then just add on something else like a midazolam infusion? Ask her to please stop. <laughs> oh, geez. <laughs> Continue the propofol infusion and add on a ketamine infusion. Continue the propofol infusion, add a ketamine infusion, plus add another anti-epileptic, like some of you guys are offering, valproate, phosphenatoin, leucosamide, phenytoin, any of those. Or should I just add another anti-epileptic like valproate, phosphenatoin, or leucosamide? What do you guys think would be an option here? So someone said C. A lot of people are saying C. A couple of people are saying C. I shouldn't say a lot. 
Give her Snickers. Oh my gosh. D. All right. So a lot of people are. It seems like people are picking C. So this is where, again, you have the opportunity to decide. All are correct. <laughs> All are technically correct, guys. It's really about how aggressive you want to be and what steps you want to take. Um, so here, let me explain what we could do. And again, from patients that I deal with in the neuro ICU, we do all of these. It just depends upon the scenario and what you've tried. Let's say that we did a propofol infusion and we did a midazolam infusion and it wasn't working. Well, maybe I just switch and get rid of the midazolam and I switch it to ketamine and maybe ketamine will work. So again, I could try a propofol infusion and I could add on something like midazolam to really, really increase the GABA A activity to really try to shut down those seizures. Or I could give propofol, which will actually work to do what? Increase the GABA A activity, so increasing the depolariz uh, hyperpolarization of those neurons, decreasing action potentials, and give ketamine, which will act on the NMDA receptors and help to decrease the depolarization from the glutaminergic pathway. Or I could continue propofol, add on ketamine, and then maybe if they're still seizing, add on an anti-epileptic that we already had. So valproate, phosphonatoin, vilcosamide. Okay, or maybe I don't even want to be aggressive at all. Maybe I have them on propofol. I did a benzo. You know, I've tried to reverse any quickly reversible causes, and all I want to do is just add on another anti-epileptic. Okay, how much would this time will this algorithm probably take in real life? It, it depends. It really, like I've had people who have non-convulsive status epilepticus, and they could be seizing for sometimes day, like a day. Um, it's really tough. It's just about how aggressive you want to be. Now, if I had someone who's been seizing for a long time, I'm going to be very aggressive. I'm going to try to shut everything down. So I would probably go with C if it was like a very aggressive kind of thing. I would hit them with, we already have them on propofol, add ketamine, add another anti-epileptic if I have to. It just depends. Maybe if it's not as bad and you want to see if I add another anti-epileptic, they'll stop. Add on valproate phosphonatoin, okay? Again, it's all about your decision, your preference, and about how aggressive you want to be, okay? <laughs> Let's say that we went with the option. Out of all of those, though, if I were to give my preference, if I were to give my preference, I would have, we had the propofol, I would have added ketamine. I like to add ketamine. The only reason why I like ketamine is that propofol will hit the GABA receptors, ketamine will hit the glutamate receptors, particularly the NMDA ones. So I'm hitting two different pathways in the seizure pathway. So I'm shutting down, down those. Then I would add another anti-epileptic. Okay, so I would have preferred C. So a lot of you guys did pick C. That's actually what I would have gone for. I would like to be a little bit more aggressive. Let's say that we did that and the person is still seizing. Okay, what do I do next? Do I start them on a pentobarbital infusion to really just like shut down these seizures? Do I continue propofol? Add, you know, we add the ketamine like we already did, and we already added two anti-epileptics. Maybe add on a third one. Do I start a ketogenic diet, or do I search for any kind of underlying elucidated causes that maybe I just haven't picked up and I've missed for some reason? What do you guys think would be the best option here? So again, should I really just pentobarbital, continue the propofol ketamine, hit them with a third anti-epileptic, start a ketogenic, or search for any elucid, unelucidated causes? All right. So a lot of people are saying pentobarb. Some are saying search for elucidated causes. Some are saying all. All are correct. <laughs> you can do all of them. Again, it's about preference. Maybe if you wanted to. And also, here's the thing. By this time, here's a reason why. Whenever you guys are taking a test and you have an option of like all of these, and it, you know, searching for causes that have not been elucidated yet is on that option, along with another one that could be an option. It's most likely gonna be all of them. 
Uh, I think that at this point, the person is in refractory, super refractory status epilepticus. And we're missing something. And we have to find that thing that we're missing. There's something in their history, in their drug list, in their labs. I don't know what, but I'm missing something. And I need to figure out what I'm missing. Okay? Now, pentobarbital would be an option. You could definitely do a pentobarbital infusion if you wanted to. Uh, and start that off. You could continue the propofol and add a third antiepileptic. You could start a ketogenic diet or you could search for causes. I think all of them are great options. Um, what I would particularly do in kind of a clinical scenario here is I would probably continue with the propofol, the ketamine, maybe add on another antiepileptic and start a ketogenic diet and then start searching for underlying causes. Okay? Start a ketogenic diet. Ketogenic diets, the mechanism for it isn't completely understood. The thought is, is that it basically, if you derive the brain of glucose and you only provide it with the ketone bodies, it may help in suppressing seizures. Um, again, the mechanism of it isn't completely understood, but it's it seemed to be somewhat effective for people. But yeah, what I would have done is I'd probably continue the propofol, continue the ketamine, add a third anti-epileptic on, start the ketogenic diet and start searching for underlying causes. I don't like to go to pentobarbital coma until it's like literally the last result or resort, um, just because it really complicates things pretty significantly. Okay, so we're missing something, right? We gotta figure out what we're missing. So what tests should I order for this patient that I need to think about could be potentially hiding something that they're that's causing them to continue to keep seizing? You could, uh, as a, oh geez, as as it back, you could definitely use the barbiturates. The reason why I would try to hold off on that is that the literature suggested that it really prolongs ICU stays. It has a lot of complications, significantly hypotensive, um, significant respiratory depression, significant sedation. You also have increased risk of ileus, DVTs, immunosuppression, hypothermia. There's just a lot of things that I would probably try to save that for the last resort and see if maybe there's just something quick that I'm missing and figure that out. All right, so CT, brain, EEG, CRP, LPs, MRIs. Now she has a paddock issue too. <laughs> ABG, CBC. Yeah, so a lot of you guys are hitting a lot of them. Pregnancy test, definitely should do a pregnancy test. Okay. Hepatic encephalopathy, CBC. All right, so here's what we got. Non-contrast CT, we should look for any structural lesions. Does she have a, you know, does she have an acute ischemic stroke? Does she have an ICH? Does she have a subarachnoid hemorrhage? Well, there's a, was there an unkind of missed trauma and she has an epidural hematoma, subdural hematoma? Um, is there any tumors, brain abscesses, any encephalitis present? Get a CBC, maybe she has an elevated white count. CMP, look to see if she has any hepatic encephalopathy, uremic encephalopathy, any electrolyte abnormalities, hyperaminemia. Check a beta HCG to make sure that she's not pregnant and she actually technically is a clamptic. A urine tox to make sure that there's no particular drugs that are causing this. Um, a lumbar puncture to look to see if there's any kind of meningitis, encephalitis, or any other kind of autoimmune effects there. An ABG just to see if there is any acidosis because acidosis can definitely trigger seizures. A chest x-ray to make sure that there's not any pneumonia. Um, and a 12 EDKG just because her, when I was looking, you know, when we look at the monitor, it looks weird. It's saying prolonged QT on the monitor and, it, and then the QRSs are looking wide. So let's get a 12 EDKG as well. Think about that. <laughs> okay, guys. All right, and I think all of you guys hit it pretty good. The other thing you could add on there is blood cultures. It's going to take some time to come back, but we can also add that on too if you guys wanted to. All righty. Whoa, a crack in the case. Oh, so later on, we're talking with the family. And when we talk with the family, the mother tells you that they notice that the patient has really been depressed lately. And she noticed that when she was taking her pills that she takes for neuropathy and for migraine prophylaxis, I was like, oh, and I was like, oh, what, what's it called? She's like, ah, it's like trip, trip, to, trip to leave something or something like that. Uh, but, but I've noticed that there's so many like pills missing from the bottle. Uh, what, you know, what the heck? I don't, I don't know why that is. So that's interesting. On top of that, you noticed that whenever you got that ABG, she had a metabolic acidosis. 
Um, and then you actually have an ABG ordered. And from that ABG, you got the metabolic acidosis. You also notice that our QT interval is pretty prolonged from that 12 lead EKG that you got. And our QRS is also really wide on the 12 lead EKG. <laughs> oh, shoot. Oh, Harsh Metal, man, with the win. So Harsh Metal walks up like a rock star ninja nerd to the nurse and says, hey, nurse, give them this medication. And then you drop the mic. What medication are you going to give to this person? So a couple of people already said it. Amitriptyline, yeah. So amitriptyline, TCA toxicity. <laughs> So what drug are you going to walk up, drop the mic and say, give this and then walk away? Come on, ninja nerds. <laughs> All right, I'm going to give you the answer. Oh, sodium bicarbonate. Yep, you say, hey, give the patient Rishav Raj 44. Go up to the nurse and say, hey, give the patient 50 milliliters of 7.5 sodium bicarbonate and walk away. And guess what happened? Guess what? The patient stopped seizing. So if they stopped seizing, what was their particular cause of their seizure? Why were they seizing then? What, what's, what's the diagnosis? You guys already hit it. Her diagnosis was a TCA overdose. So she was popping those, you know, amitriptyline suckers like Skittles. Okay. So Ninja Nerds, you fixed her. You guys took care of her. You started off, you intubated her to protect her airway. You suctioned her out, suctioned the oral secretions, open up her airway. You intubated her. You looked for any reversible causes. You fixed those causes. Then after that, you did the next thing. You gave her benzos. That didn't work. You loaded her up with an anti-epileptic and started her on propofol. That didn't work. You added on another agent like ketamine, and that didn't work. You added on two more anti-epileptic medications, and that didn't work. You were getting ready to start a pentobarbital infusion, and they were like, ah, oh, something's missing. You found out from the family she was taking too much tricyclics, and then all of a sudden you say 50 milliliters, 7.5 sodium bicarb, boom, the seizure stops. Okay? So the next goal for her is to try to get her off all these dang infusions, discontinue some of the anti-epileptics now that we fig figured out the cause, obtain a psychiatric consult for this kind of suicidal attempts, and then extubate the patient and transfer out of the uh, ICU. Okay. To be fair, if she hits Torsad, somebody's going to be pushing Bicar right after the mag. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. So any questions or anything that you guys have here? I know a lot of the answers were like, oh, this technically could be correct. This could be correct. The thing with like in clinical practice is there's more than one way to do something. In the textbook, you know, literature way, it goes ABCs, reverse, easily reversible causes, benzos, load anti-epileptic. After you load the anti-epileptic, start an infusion of either propofol, midazolam, ketamine, and then from there, pentobarbital, coma, as well as searching for reversible causes. But sometimes, depending upon how intense we want to be, how aggressive we want to be, you can go about these all different types of ways, okay? Should we have done lumbar puncture? Uh, in this case, I mean, we, we probably didn't need to um, based upon like from what we could actually obtain from the CT. Um, we didn't see any focal lesions there. Now, CT doesn't always show meningitis or meningeal enhancement. Um, so that sometimes would be something that wouldn't cue me in. If she was febrile, if she also did have an elevated white count, if she had any other signs of meningitis or encephalitis, sure, I could do an LP. When I say that someone's seizing, sometimes it may not just be generalized tonic-clonic seizing. If we had her on a continuous EEG, and while on the continuous EEG, she wasn't visibly seizing, but she was having non-convulsive seizures that you only can see from an EEG, then that's fine to go ahead and uh, do a... Um, a lumbar puncture but if she's actively tonically clonically seizing that's a different story okay
Any other question here? Drunk DM, no, you're good. Could you please explain TCA toxicity a little? I mean, that's a lot to go down that road. What we'll have to do is eventually, if you guys watch our video coming out this uh, uh, was it Thursday, Thursday we're having a video on some seizures, so you guys will see that stuff there. All right, ninjas, we got about one minute left. Any other questions? Long-term management, I mean, again, for this, it seems like it was more uh, TCA toxicity. So uh, we just need to reverse the underlying cause of that, which is the TCAs. And then obviously treat her underlying depression or you know whatever was, triggered her to take these excessive amounts of TCAs. Will she maybe need to stay on an anti-epileptic for a little bit? Potentially. But it shouldn't be something that she should need for, um, for uh, long term. Because again, hers was more of a triggered cause. Yeah, we did an alcohol and tox screen, and everything came back. You know, um, for for that aspect, it didn't show any TCA toxicity. But um, the engineers, I hope that you guys enjoyed this. Um, it was a fun video. I hope it was more like kind of a a learning experience and an opportunity to see that there's more than one way to treat status epilepticus. Um, and I hope that you guys enjoyed it. Next week we'll have another um, uh, case study. It's going to be on headache. Um, so figuring out why this person is having a headache. If you guys want to start thinking about that, building up some differentials, thinking about that stuff ahead of time, that'll be our next case study next week. Um, I hope that you guys enjoyed it. I love you guys. I thank you guys so much for being so awesome.